We pay attention to sex in the media and sex in the city, but we don't talk much about when things aren't going so great or when they could be better. Now, with all the new technology, research, and increasing openness about intimate topics, we have something to talk about, like Kourtney Kardashian's new lavender-colored gummies for vaginal health called, wait for it, Purr. Welcome to Skin Tuition. I'm Heather Furness. And I'm Josh Corman. As two plastic surgeons, we lay aside our scalpels and explore the non-surgical world to bring you what's new, what's safe, and what to look for when you're ready to hit refresh. It is a true pleasure to introduce our very special guest, Dr. Jennifer Walden. Dr. Walden is a plastic surgeon in private practice in Austin, Texas. She is a leader in surgical and non-surgical cosmetic procedures and lectures internationally, and she is the Aesthetic Society's first female president, now past president. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Heather and Josh. I'm so glad to be here. So we'll talk about both men and women in this episode, but let's start with women. Uh, Jennifer, you opened a vaginal rejuvenation center in your practice in Austin. Can you tell us why women would be interested in vaginal rejuvenation and what treatments you offer? Yes. You know, up until about 2016 and and, and around that time, it, mainly we talked about male sexual health. And, you know, Viagra is one of the most well-known, well-marketed drugs ever there were no non-invasive options for women and women were dismissed by about menopause. I think as doctors such as Heather Furness and I like came of age and came to the podium and did studies and we started to actually see clinical trials with device technology that worked and hormone therapies that work for women that are perimenopausal, our industry responded to it. So we began to develop device technology that's energy-based to help with sexual health, all the issues we can get into. And once I started offering that in my practice, it really grew. Women are very responsive to that because we have had no options. They're surgical for so long and fraught with complications, mesh, bladder mesh, all that stuff. So that is kind of how this is all developed in my practice as a plastic surgeon. But we we really owe people like Dr. Furness here, who's done a lot of studies on these things and labiaplasty, a debt of gratitude because it's science his surgeons like her that actually help bring things to market and bring this into our view. Thanks, Jennifer. Let's take a deeper dive into the complaints women have that can be addressed non-surgically, like vaginal laxity, ability to co- orgasm sensation, vaginal atrophy, lubrication, stress urinary uh, incontinence. So what do you do? You mentioned devices, energy devices. What are all the modalities that you can offer women? Um, Usually what we do is we have have them examined and we get a history from them. This can be done by myself or my nurse practitioner. And we we make sure that there are no other comorbidities or, or masses, anything that they need to be treated with first. But then we usually can assign them into a treatment modality based on their symptoms how quickly they want to get it done, what's their budget, how much time do they have, are they just visiting Austin once or do they live there? But there's different technologies to treat different things. We have Erbium laser that's an ablative laser, similar to the kind of the fractional laser we get on our face. We can do intravaginally for stress urinary incontinence and to help with lubrication and sensation. Radiofrequency microneedling, like you may have heard about before, again, help to tighten the skin on the face. Um, you may hear about some of these brands that the Kardashians are using. Well, we also have that for the vagina. We do radiofrequency microneedling for the vagina, which is excellent for tightening and sensation. In most of these modalities that I mentioned, whether it's radiofrequency or laser therapy, usually require more than one treatment, but doesn't everything in the medical spa, I mean, doesn't Botox, doesn't Dysport, doesn't filler, doesn't laser to the face require maybe a maintenance time every year to two years. And so that is very true with vaginal health. I I think it got criticized early on for not being permanent, but how could it possibly be permanent? Nothing we do in our, in our non-surgical medical spa environment is permanent and for a good reason. So I think that's a good point because 
you know, radio frequency is like the energy of the decade. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that we can do. There's so many different machines that are advertised by doctors, by companies. Um, and obviously they all need, to, as you point out, need to be done in a series. I think the one of the important questions is the the permanence or lack thereof, meaning, okay, people are okay necessarily to do a, a maintenance treatment maybe once every year, six months, but maybe not every month or two weeks or four weeks. So um, what in, in your practice with all the technologies you do, on average, would you say, how, how often do they the maintenance after the series, whatever the series is, whether it's three or four or five, what, when, and how often do you think that, or you advise your patients that they would need to have a touch up? Yeah. As you mentioned correctly, they usually involved in a series of three spaced about, you know, six weeks to eight weeks apart. And then we usually will tell patients, you know, everything is based on their clinical exam before, you know, if they have a large amount of laxity or, or stress urinary incontinence, it may involve more, but usually once a year would be a maintenance um, algorithm. Some women who swear by certain technologies, whether it's vaginal or, or muscle stimulation for the abdomen, will come back religiously, you know, every six months. And, and that's fine. We like that. I mean, I, I like that. It works. I'm a business owner. I like, I like retaining my patients and seeing them back. But, but some, some of them base it on just how, how they, how tight do you want to be? You know, how, how good do you want sex to feel? And, um, I, you know, I think women for so long never got the, even the question. So, so they kind of graded it based on, on their response. And it's interesting to me, you know, with the radio frequency and the laser treatments and that sort of thing, everyone responds a little differently. So someone who might not respond well to radio frequency, we might then put into a category of laser um, vaginal treatment or, or vice versa, because our bodies just respond differently to different energy. I, for example, respond very, very well to radio frequency. I was showing my estheticians, you know, slides throughout the years of me doing radio frequency and it takes your jawline back. Well, similarly, I can respond to radio frequency anywhere in the body. So some people will come back after a series of three and say, you know, I, I didn't experience much of a difference at all. And those people will can, get, might put into a surface ablative category, meaning laser that's going to treat the surface epithelium or surface of the vagina. And that's just what they need maybe to get resurfaced and to feel a little bit tighter and to kind of strengthen and help with stress urinary incontinence um, and all those tissues right around the urethra that can provide structure there. How does the heat help reduce the stress urinary incontinence. You mentioned the tissues. Tell us a little bit, you know, why why women get stress urinary incontinence after, it's typically after childbirth, would you say? Right. Yeah. Typically after childbearing, it's not uncommon at all to have a little stress urinary incontinence, which is just leaking leakage of urine with laughter or jumping or coughing. It's like rather more common than not. And so we've lived with that for many decades, but now, you know, getting a couple of treatments um, involving radio frequency or the laser heat energy can help tighten the muscles and can, it can, you know, it helps really to help contract the surf surface of the inner layer. And then it causes what we call neocollagenesis or, or the induction of new collagen formation in the wall of the vagina. And some of these can stimulate di different muscle layers as well. We do have a muscle stimulation technology called Imsula that you actually sit down on something and you don't have to remove your clothing, but it is in a muscle stimulation technology that can help strengthen the pelvic floor muscles. And so that's even stimulating deeper within the pelvic floor for women who ha have have severe stress, urinary incontinence, men or post-prostatectomy that have some issues too. And so anyone that needs pelvic floor strengthening can benefit from that particular machine. But yeah, the heat can cause um, contraction of the tissues and new collagen formation, um, basically. I mean, I realize both men and women carry each other's hormones. So we're more mm -hmm. similar than we are different, but yet the anatomy and a lot of things are different. So, and, and also exactly how you market, because women often will go to events together, whereas guys are mm -hmm. different. You know, they'll go to a golf game together and a basketball <laughs> game together, but they won't exactly go to a sexual <laughs> a wellness clinic yeah. together. Um, yeah. So, Tell us, how, how does that work? 
So, um, I mean, I think the basis starts with, like you said, hormone and the hormonal axis. And, and as we age, men lose testosterone as well. And women can benefit from testosterone, we found, and can be somewhat protective. So the foundation of, of this whole par- arm of my practice is me partnering with my nurse practitioner, and she does hormone therapy. So she sees you, assesses symptoms, men or women, and I'll kind of go down the male pathway here in a minute, but diagnoses whether you have low T, low, t, less t- low testosterone or not. And then she may prescribe um, pellets to implant to the tissues of, you know, like just to put um, like a a subcutaneous pellet into the, into the buttock of subcutaneous fat or, or creams, um, that sort of things or pills. Um, but whatever it is that, that begins the basis for then what we'll then refer to as, as like the next phase. And with men often it'll be, um, erectile dysfunction. And so, um, she can prescribe medicines. Of course we can, we, we've been able to do that a long time, but we also have, other thing modalities that can help men. Uh, we have extracorporeal shockwave therapy. You may have heard Big D Wave or Gaines Wave. Those are just brand names for a shockwave therapy that helps build new blood vessels in the penis and, and to help widen them. Um, we also have what we call the O shot for orgasm shot for the women and for the P shot for the men. And that is basically taking your own blood and using the platelets, injecting that into the corpus or the body of the penis, the muscle, and that thereby stimulates it to a little bit more sensation. It helps with erectile dysfunction. And, and those things have really grown a whole lot in my practice, very much so in the past five years, I would say, to where we have a very strong male contingency in our practice. And about three or four years ago, I started to offer on my end what I do, which not many people, but I offer male enhancement with fillers. So hyaluronic acid filler into the male penis. Um, I did one today. I mean, today was like the crown jewel because I did. we did a case where my nurse practitioner came in and um, she did a, the P shot for, for him. He had, he had, you know, different things he wanted treated. So P shot. He had banding, so I came in and did a little collagenase and broke up some banding in the penis with an injection, and then I did the J shot. We call it the J shot, but that's male enhancement with HA filler. They're all in different layers and treating different things, but the last part that I did enhances the size and the girth. So mainly girth and width of the penis, but also can, the, you know, can help with the length as well as it telescopes out, and, and that has been incredibly popular too. Like you'd, you'd just be amazed. And, and my male patients, like you say, they don't come in groups but they are the most appreciative, low maintenance people in my practice. So we re- I really enjoy my male patients. It wouldn't be the same without them. And I do that, that J shot probably about two or three times a week. And what is the recovery like? What are the instructions you give them? Usually that, you know, just to ice, you know, similar to, we always compare things to women because that's something they can understand because their wives or girlfriends have all bought lip filler or breast implants. So I just compare it very much like, you know, take it easy for the next two to three days, ice, just as you would a swollen lip. I, it's going to be bruised and swollen in the next two to three days. I ask them not to have sexual intercourse for about, you know, about seven to 10 days, just because you want all those little needle holes to close back up and and not not have any bacteria environment surrounding them. So no sexual intercourse. They can manually, um, you know, do what they need to do to help spread the filler. If for some reason, just like you tell someone who got a little filler in their cheek, if you feel a little lump, you know, if you want to go ahead and just smooth that, you can smooth that a little bit because hyaluronic acid is moldable in the first, you know, two to three days. And so they can do that if they'd like, uh, manual, um, but otherwise it's, it's pretty low maintenance. They go home and they rest the weekend and not a lot of concerns. They usually will come back, you know, if there's a little asymmetry or, or a little lump or bump, they may come back at about, we, we have them wait for about four to six weeks. Um, we can dissolve a bump um, just like you could in the lip or the cheek. Um, and then if, if they want more, it's definitely a foundational procedure that you, it, you can enhance the size, but it grows, it gets, it, it gets foundational, it gets bigger as we go along, for lack of a better word. You can do that. Um, and so I may begin with 18 to 23 syringes on the first visit. And then maybe the next visit, which is a quarter, you know, in three or four months away, we may just build upon that foundation with about eight syringes to 10 syringes. And each syringe of those fillers, as you probably have heard, is, is just like a teaspoon. It's one cc, one cubic centimeter. So so that's why it sounds like a lot, but into the male penis, it actually spreads very nicely and it doesn't look too big or unnatural. And are there risks that people should know about? 
I think the the risks would be, you know, lumps, bumps, um, asymmetries. I I personally have not had, you know, I guess if we went through the litany of things like erectile dysfunction, urinary tract infection, I've not had any of those issues with this. Just I think it would be extremely important to go to someone who does this and that that knows anatomy, i.e. like a board certified plastic surgeon doing it, um, you know, or, or urologist that, that does a lot of them because it's not something you would enter upon lightly. But um, but I think avoidance of complications about is about knowledge of the th- three-dimensional anatomy, which is what we're pros at, really. That's what plastic surgeons are specialists of, of the face, breast, body, and genitals, really. So uh, we've been talking about non-surgical treatments, but sometimes non-surgical treatments may not be sufficient. So for example, let's say a mother comes in saying she doesn't feel anything um, with intercourse after she had her children. Uh, would you perform, when would you decide to perform a vaginoplasty versus doing something non-surgical? Does that depend on her anatomy, her workup, her goals? Um, how do you approach that? Yeah, usually, um, usually I would say nine times out of 10, the, those patients um, arrive in my my surgical clinic, like my clinic, and they're a candidate for vaginoplasty. If they say, like, I, I, you know, had children, um, vaginal ch- childbirth, can't feel much anymore, gaping, those are the people, and when you examine them, they have a large hiatus to the vagina, maybe a episiotomy tear. And, and as you know, um, that's more of a layered muscular mucosal closure that we redo with perineoplasty and vaginal tightening, and that can help a lot. So that's one category. And then if on exam, they really have a good, va- I mean, some of those women have good vaginal tightening and they're, the anatomical reason is not quite as, as transparent. Then I'll put them into the category of my non-surgical where we have them, they have to you know, fill out three different surveys. They're standardized surveys, sexual satisfaction, vaginal laxity, and urinary um, issues. And that helps me to quantify, like, where is the issue originating from? I want to know, and there's so many issues that go, as we all know, that go into sexual satisfaction and the ability to feel and orgasm and be happy with sex. There's so many to, um, brain, you know, from here on down, right? So we want to really go to the core of that issue and find out what can help them. And that's really going to be end up being more of the non-invasive route and the hormonal route. And getting them back on hormones is step number one, like estrogen and p- progesterone, and t- um, even testosterone. Testosterone helps women with libido more than anything I've seen. I mean, it just has helped a lot for women to respond spark their, their marriage. Um, when they've been super tired, worn out, had the kids, did a, did a lot of the work, but um, once they got back on testosterone, some on t- some like bio T for example, is what we use in playing a testosterone pellet. They have energy again, a little better physique looking better and then more libido. So one question in, in this hormone replacement therapy zone, there's a, it's kind of all over the map a little bit. And if people are somewhat scared about the hormone concept, and Mm -hmm. um, especially as people get older, and there's a lot of patients who are in that postmenopausal women category that are really trying to figure out, you know, what what can they do, not just for their face, but for their all Mm -hmm. all of their bodies. And Mm -hmm. and so how how would you? And this is true for both women and. For men, I mean, there's andropause, as they talk about, and menopause. So for that age group, which I think is clearly an important and growing age group, how how would you uh, relate to them? Is it still the same testosterone and that's how it works? Or is there a different a different version for that age group? Well, I mean, for, for whether menopause or andropause, it still is going to be um, being evaluated, clinical symptoms. Um, their their history, past surgeries, if they've had any past surgeries, any past, um, we, for women, we want to know, have you had any uterine cancer, breast cancer, pap smear has to be um, negative or normal within the last year. For men, we need to make sure your PSA is not high. Um, we do an exam of the genital region. And when I say we, I mainly mean my nurse practitioner because I'm in the operating room and the nurse practitioner is the one that is really good at sitting and talking and delving into these areas and getting a really good history and physical. Um, As you know, surgeons are great in the operating room, right? (laughs) So much with the talking for a long time. But um, yeah, no. So my nurse practitioner really delves into that. So we don't want to put some some people on hormones because 
they're, it's contraindicated. You've got prostate cancer. We're not going to put you on testosterone. You know, um, you're not cured yet, you know, or, 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 or uh, you have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer history. So we would get medical clearance from your doctor, your primary care doctor um, it, or oncologist, if you had any of those issues in the past and wanted to be treated, because we want to be on the same page with your primary care doctor. But I, I would just say it's just a very detailed exam and, and a, a very detailed hormone panel that we assess um, not just the standard hormones, but ones we don't think of and vitamins and minerals and all sorts of things um, and amino acids in your body and B12. You know, there are a lot of reasons, um, underlying reasons why we start to decline in our energy level and what our skin looks and our hair feels and our sexual libido. It's not just testosterone and estrogen. There's so many other reasons. Oh, I just wanted to ask one last question about nitric oxide mm-hmm. for male enhancement. Do you What do you think about that? Do you prescribe it, something you recommend or not? So just, you know, Viagra or, you know, a, a different pill like Cialis, like um, f- pills like that that help to stimulate erection, those usually will prescribe like a low-dose Cialis, which is a, is a vasodilator, opens up the blood vessels. With any time we start to do any type of erectile dysfunction treatment, like the extracorporeal shock wave with PRP, the P shots interposed like every four weeks, because it only helps. It only those medications only can like help as a as a, a, a a foundation to help open up those blood vessels and we'll come in and stimulate new blood vessels, what we call angiogenesis within the penis. But, but we need that nitric oxide or the, the um, Cialis sildenafil to help open up the blood vessels. So th- those do have a place in our practice as well. Again, my nurse practitioner, who ha- that's her background is, are, are these things is usually the person prescribing those um, I don't particularly prescribe those in my clinic. I'm dealing more with with um, cosmetic, surgical, but that is part of our our sexual wellness arm of our practice. Uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2018, the FDA came down hard on some of the um, the lasers and I think maybe one radio frequency uh, device as far as um, using these for uh, cosmetic reasons, non um, sort of cancer reasons. And the the FDA has been uh, pretty quiet. There were complaints about burns and whatnot mm-hmm. and lack of study. Uh, is there a reason the FDA has been quiet? And are, uh, do you feel that we're, we're studying these things more, these devices better? Yes, I think I think it, they're, like I'd mentioned in 2016, 2017, when they when they started to come on the market, every so every laser device, as you know, or radio frequency device in our in our whole field, if you went into a trade show, they had just developed like a, a new vaginal wand that goes on it, you know, and, and we're selling it and marketing it. And they quite, ha- I think they put the, you know, the, the cart before the horse and and more clinical studies needed to be done. We needed to tamp down. So the FDA really kind of put a damper on the marketing of the manufacturers and said that they had to kind of put a proper label and had proper disclaimers on the marketing of these devices because they were coming on so strong in the in this wellness aesthetic market, right? right not treating patients who are medically ill. Um, and so um, that's what happened. And those those companies were, you know, they responded pretty quickly and did those things. And and, and they did studies with me, with you, with a lot of, of well-known doctors that were in the space. And I think that that helped to gain legitimacy for these devices. Um, and I think some of the warnings that, that were off, the FDA cited warnings off the MOD database was, was a self-reporting, like I could go in tonight and say, you know, you know, about, Five years ago, I got a, like a little burn and it turned red on my cheek. And that's a burn, right? That's reported as a burn of the FDA. So it's self-reporting. So the MOD database had some reports. And when you really look back into it, there was like maybe 15 or 16 reports. You really look back in. A lot of them were kind of self-explanatory. Like there were two employees playing with a device after hours and they were trying it out on themselves and one actually burned the other because they hadn't been properly trained. So if you really looked into the history of some of those mod database complaints, they were, they were not, um, it wasn't quite fair to, to us who were providing real treatments and we were researching it and making sure we were being safe for our patients. So that's, I think, I think they got, kind of got quiet after that. If you were going to get out your crystal ball um, and what innovations Uh, We talked about radio frequency being, you know, the energy of the decade. But can you sort of envision innovations seeing in the future? One thing that that I'm still trying to understand is between the non-ablative, meaning the the non-burning 
devices and the ablative, which is more recovery, but potentially longer lasting. What, what, what do some of these therapies that are we know now that would be nice to have, wish to have, that you could potentially see in, in the innovative space to improve going forward? I think, you know, I always kind of look at what are the predecessors coming down the pipeline for other areas of the body. So I think of without without the heat or thermal injury, um, you know, like there's there's micro coring. So we have a, we have devices that are used for ta- creating tiny non thermal channels in the skin to help contract. So micro coring might occur. Um, there's a device called Elicor that does that, and so that's could could that could they make a component for vaginal health? Well, they might be already making one, but that might be an idea there. Other, otherwise, I think ultrasound, ultrasonic technology is good, you know, and not quite used in the vaginal space. So we use ultrasound, like, for example, Softwave is an ultrasound technology that's like, help me kind of keep my jawline, you know, it kind of helps lift in, 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 in kind of the middle age and helps kind of c- contract. And so maybe an ultrasound version, uh, um, ultrasonic tightening version, you might have heard of earlier iterations called all therapy. So maybe that perhaps. And then I always think what what's really interesting to me is I got um, like an IPL laser hair removal sent to me so I could do a video for this company and it's a do it yourself at home device. Now I'm not like saying go on TikTok and make these devices or anything like that. <laughs> All I'm saying is the idea of that they are now they're starting to like make safe do it yourself laser hair removal devices, right? Cause I've been, I've been buying them. I've been kind of trying them out because I recommend them to my patients when they're like, what do I do in between like all these 16 k- appointments for laser hair removal? Cause you have to keep doing it. Um, but like, a, I would think there, there are some good do it yourself devices for vaginal tightening involving led light therapy, low energy radio frequency. And so I just think the the safe vetted DIY or do it yourself um, treatments at home probably have a lot of appeal to the TikTok generation. And do you see a role for exosomes uh, in the future yeah, with the <laughs> exosomes? Yeah, kind of that that cause a stimulation of growth factors to be released. That sort of thing. We do use those in our practice currently for P shots, O shots, and, and some hair res- restoration. I think that that's an that's an area that again the FDA has smartly said, let's, let's research this before we start making wild claims. Um, so that's coming, that's, I think that's newer treatment, but I do think that shows promise from what we're seeing and, and how it's working for some people. Not It doesn't help ever. I mean, again, these things, some people are non-responders. You might do PRP if they don't respond to exosomes or vice versa. And do you think there's any role in, um, maybe this is a question more for your nurse practitioner, but there's the, like you said, A lot of uh, sexual health starts with the brain and the talking part, the helping people to understand, obviously they want results, but I think results come from a multifactorial place. So um, Mm -hmm. have you, is is that part of how she um, treats the patients and with the follow-ups or just wondering how how the, there's got to be some component of psychology here. Uh, I think there is in every every facet of our, of, of my practice to aesthetic practice how we look how do I look back to myself when I look in the mirror and am I happy with that that is prevalent in our, even even Heather and your mind practice is psychology but particularly in the sexual wellness yes um, Ashley and I have both um, dealt with patients who are having problems or issues, and and she's very, very good at, at, at empathy and sympathy. I've had patients come to me, you know, privately and tell me um, that they feel like they can talk to her because she's not judging them. And that was so great to hear. I, even from like a family member of mine who is having hormonal issues came to me and told me, it's because she's not judging me, I can open up to her and thereby she can help me. And she's helping me, by the way. And so that's why it's important to pick the right provider, I think. But I think, as you know, um, we, we, we know from our own plastic surgery practices when it might be appropriate to refer someone to a professional psychologist and, and that might be um, someone with body dysmorphia, where, where they see something that just we don't, that we, we don't see at all, but they're seeing it themselves. And we've had a couple of patients that we've had to get, get with their primary care doctor and, and talk about those types of referrals when we, when we can't help with our, what we have to offer. How would you recommend people find somebody who really is a, a true professional? You mentioned 
um, board certified plastic surgeons, urologists. There, uh, you know, there's a lot of marketing out there, mm-hmm. and a lot of people, and it varies by state who can do what. Right. And and sometimes people don't care if they aren't legally able to do mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. So what uh, what do you recommend to, or what would you recommend to people to look for? So, um, I mean, I think, you know, 10 years ago, the plastic surgeon on this would say, just don't go to any med spa. Don't go to a med spa. So I own med spas. So you don't, it's very confusing. I would, I would say um, a medical spa is just a standalone practice that does sexual wellness. So, so we don't necessarily say that anymore because we actually own and run them now. And so I would say you look for a, bur- a board certified plastic surgeon that does sexual health and or a medical spa that they direct the, the, the functioning and the operation of and the hiring of. Um, and so, for example, in, in that I have a medical spa in New York. Here's just an example of one. Right. Um, a, my medical director there is she's a Mount Sinai trained internist, but she did integrative and functional health. And now she knows more about hormones than I do. I go to her for my, to help me with my hormones, right? She's so smart and she's up to date on the literature. And that's an example of a medical spa you should feel safe going to. So you have to kind of research and vet like in the about us or meet our staff on the website. And when you talk to them and make the appointment and meet someone um, kind of verify those credentials. And, and that's a good way to do that is just make sure that this is what their specialty is. They've likely spoke about it and unlectured about it. They've likely studied it and maybe written a paper or two about it at least. And, um, and they're board certified in plastic surgery. Yeah, I think, you know, with gynecology, it's interesting. There's been a lot of resistance to, mm-hmm. well, you know, anything dealing with cosmetic vulva vaginal treatment, surgical or non-surgical. I think that's slowly changing. Uh, the Women's Health Initiative also uh, sort of put a, a damper on on hormone therapy. And I think that is slowly changing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think when you look at um, OB-GYNs for so long, they the way... Um, and they'll probably like be mad. I say, this, but the way they were trained was kind of patriarchal, and um, and that that you don't really need to worry so much about the aesthetic appearance of your labia and your genitals. That's not a that should not be a worry for you. And that was the way I think that 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 many of them were trained, and and the way the logic was because they're they're dealing with function, they're dealing with childbearing, they're weight much very weighty issues, right? Very important issues, and so it was dismissed for so long. And I think that's where we've been able to kind of help out because aesthetics is our thing. So we don't feel we don't feel bad or frivolous validating a, a woman saying, "I don't like the appearance of my labia. They look awful. They 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 produce camel toes." It hurts to have sex. So all those things we've kind of validated. Now, I think that the, the lot of gynecologists are, are now coming on board. Well, Jennifer, this has really been very enlightening for me personally. And also, too, <laughs> uh, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure uh, has been very uh, useful for our, our listeners. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think we, we hit all the high points. Thank you. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Skin Tuition. Join us every two weeks as we tackle topics from hair loss to hormones and pimples to wrinkles, discovering new ways to feel better about ourselves. So follow us, subscribe, send us questions, any suggestions for guests. We'd be happy to listen and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks.